code blue was going off. I felt like I couldn't breathe. His face was yellow and his lips were blue and I knew he wasn't breathing. I can't breathe, I can't breathe, something's wrong with me, I can't breathe. He was dying and I was sitting right there and I didn't even know it. It had been the happiest day of my life with my kids and it turned into the worst day. Just 24 hours earlier, a happy Melissa Pedersen had accompanied her kids, Kelly and Anders, to UCSF's Kidney Transplant Center in San Francisco for what was supposed to be a life-changing surgery. He just said, you know, that he was so happy to give this to me. Kelly's health problems began when she was a baby. Hospitalized with grave kidney problems, doctors said she had only a 30% chance of making it. But Kelly not only survived, she thrived. She was on the debate team. She did cheerleading. But what Kelly treasured most was spending time with her younger brother. You know, people have their partners that are their twin flame. Anders was my twin flame. We were like twins. When Kelly went into kidney failure at 30 and needed a transplant, it surprised no one that her twin flame, Anders, stepped up. He was the first person to say, I don't want anyone else testing for this. If I'm a match, I'm going to donate to you. That vow began a year-long journey. It took a long time for me to accept it because I didn't want him to get sick or, you know, to something to happen to him. The most critical decision, picking the best transplant center, which turned out to be right in their backyard. The University of California, San Francisco Organ Transplant Program had performed more kidney transplants than any other center in the U.S. They're number one. They have to be the best if they're ranked number one. In 2015, Anders began a rigorous six-month evaluation that required a donor be in excellent health. He just wanted me to be happy and to be able to have children. On Friday, October 23rd, the surgery began at 8.20 a.m. Oh, it was a long time. It was a long time. It was scary. At 1.28, Melissa got a text. The doctor called and said they were both doing great. Brother and sister were in rooms across the hall from each other recovering. And he did say to her that it was the best day of his life. But while Kelly started improving immediately, hospital records show Anders was in a lot of pain. On 8, on a scale of 1 to 10. At 429, a nurse practitioner changed his medication from fentanyl to another potent opioid, Dilaudid. Opioids have some powerful side effects and that is they slow down your breathing rate and to the point that if you're sensitive to it or you get too much you'll stop breathing. The next morning after a restless night marked by multiple bouts of vomiting Anders asked his mom for sunglasses so he could sleep. I actually took a picture once he fell asleep because he looked so sweet with his sunglasses on. That sweet photo Melissa took would later serve as a critical clue. It shows Anders wasn't on a pulse oximeter, a common electronic device that clips over the tip of a patient's finger. It's used to monitor blood oxygen levels and alert hospital staff if they drop dangerously low. No pulse ox, no alarm, no warning for the morning shift nurse who doesn't realize Anders had stopped breathing. And I put my hand on his hand and his hand was cold. And then I took off his sunglasses and realized his face was yellow and his lips were blue and I knew he wasn't breathing. And the nurse didn't notice. And the nurse never touched him, never checked on him. And what are the doctors telling you at this point? They're not telling me anything. Anders is revived and put in a medically induced coma. After nine days of life support, Anders is declared brain dead. He was just 28 years old. They told us that they thought that he had a genetic flaw in his heart, and his heart just stopped. Our investigative unit consulted with several outside doctors and reviewed thousands of pages of hospital records, including an autopsy, which shows that Anders had a perfectly healthy heart. We've also learned that it wasn't UCSS protocol to use a pulse oximeter on low-risk patients like Anders. Even though it's a readily available, inexpensive device that would have sounded a critical alarm. 
That's especially important for patients like Anders, who are receiving opioids for pain. Anders was on what's known as a PCA pump, which allows patients to push a button and get additional doses up to a set limit. He was on the drug Dilaudid. The drug's own label states an initial dose should be reduced in special risk patients with renal or kidney impairments, like Anders. If one stops breathing, one accumulates carbon dioxide, and that can by and of itself stimulate a cardiac arrest. Dr. William Klein, a professor of medicine at UC Irvine for more than 40 years, became a key trial witness for the Pedersons, despite his decades-long relationship with the University of California system. Klein testified that that photo Melissa took, showing no pulse oximeter on Anders' finger, points to a critical mistake. I can't think of the reason uh, to not use one. In this gentleman's case probably would have saved his life. UCSF said the hospital couldn't comment on the case due to patient privacy, but in a statement told us that they modified their transplant protocol after this incident and now provide continuous pulse oximetry monitoring. UCSF also maintains that two investigations by organ transplant networks found no fault on behalf of UCSF. They fought us on every legal issue they could. Steve Hilliard, a medical malpractice attorney hired by the Pedersons, agrees that monitoring could have saved Anders. But he argues that wasn't what killed him. Do you think they overdosed him? Now you'll be able to hear his answer tomorrow night right here at 6. It is the basis of a brutal court battle.